who are we? We are Texas Instruments. We love open source. We'd like to contribute more. We'd like to work more. And our motto is upstream first. And that's exactly why we are here today. A uh, little bit about me and my co-author. Um, it's uh, I work in the systems domain with Texas Instruments for about two years now. And my current uh, project is about boot time optimization. Whereas Samya has also been working with Texas Instruments for about two years, and he mainly leads the RTOS stack. Um, this is the overview of, a, of the presentation right now. So what is our problem statement? It's that we have too many requirements. For a little uh, ARM core uh, to be able to um, manage. So what do we need is we need a heterogeneous system. And what I've shown right now is a simple uh, automotive infotainment use case where you want an audio chime in about 200 milliseconds, you want an early splash screen in about 500 milliseconds, and finally, a full graphical application in about 1.5 seconds. Now, this is obviously not possible with one core. So how do we manage to have heterogeneous, uh, a boot which in includes heterogeneous uh, system in early boot scenario, okay? Um, I will run through the existing sequence and uh, I will highlight what did not work for us and then what we've tried out at, at Texas Instruments. And then finally, we can have some thoughts and there were some surprises to us that we can collaborate upon. Uh, just to give a reference as to the platform that I'm talking about is the Texas Instruments is AM62P. Uh, it's a quad-core Cortex-A53 application core with two Cortex R5s running. Now, it's important that I highlight that one's called the DM, the device manager, and one's the MCU. The microcontroller application will be running of the MCU Cortex R5. Um, we can note that the multiple boot media that we support is OSPI, NOR, NAND, and EMMC, right? Um, so the typical boot sequence, uh, once you turn on the power is your PMIC is up, and I will go through each of these blocks in detail later. Uh, you have the PMIC which powers the SOC, then you jump to ROM, and then you go into your bootloader. Uh, in our case, one stage runs at uh, in the R5 core, and one in the A50, and the rest will be running on the A53 core. And once you hit U-boot, that's when we can start all our heterogeneous applications. Uh, then finally, the kernel, and then the user space. So from the time you have uh, power coming in. How does your uh, system get powered on? It's through the power management IC or the PMIC. Right? It handles voltage regulation, power monitoring, and giving the power essentially to the rails of the entire system. Uh, once the power is up, what happens uh, in a simplified manner, I just say ROM comes up. Now ROM initializes a bunch of resources to initialize the next core. Now in the K3 architecture of TI, we always boot off the R5. Um, so we enable anything and everything that is required for the DM R5 that I mentioned earlier for, uh, for it to boot. Now, I want to highlight that the ROM has device drivers to, for the specific um, boot media that we have. So it has to open these uh, uh, drivers. It has to initialize the boot media, then load the binaries, and then jump to the bootloader. The, typical bootloader that we are all used to is the U-boot. And in our case, R5 SPL, since it's called, it's running off the R5, um, it's the first stage of the bootloader where we typically do not have DDR up and running. So what do we have to contend with is a small on-chip RAM. In our case, it's 256 KB. So the main uh, job of R5 SPL is to start the DDR so that all our other cores and all the other bindings can be loaded. Um, also, again, in the K3 architecture of TI, TFA is the one that starts the ARM core. Uh, it's essentially, uh, it fixates itself as the EL3 uh, monitor handler. So once R5 SPL is done, you jump to your TFA, or uh, trusted firmware ARM. And from there, we jump to Opti, which is the non-secure Linux uh, compartment to the TFA. Uh, from uh, Opti, we load into A53 SPL, where we have uh, more functionality, and it's running off the A53. Your core is finally running at best. So from there, we jump to U-boot proper, which everybody I'm hoping is familiar with, 
where you have a wide variety of functionality available for you to boot into multiple medias. You can have a lot of functionality there. And from here, you pass the device tree, you pass the kernel, and then finally load into your kernel, which goes through a multi-threaded initialization. We have four cores. We have to use all of them, right? Uh, it initializes all our drivers. It initializes the entire system. And from now on, this is the system you're going to be working with. From at the end of the kernel is your process ID 1, which actually starts your file system, which lets you work on your user space applications. Now, all of this is very cumbersome, and too many stages are going on there. Uh, the U-boot that I highlighted is already about six seconds into the whole system, and that, that's not enough for the applications that we have, right? So what did we do? We said, we'll make our own bootloader. Because the current bootloader, we had to pivot from it because uh, there's a lot of upstream problems going on right now. And we decided to talk with the community and as to how to be able to do this. All right? So for now, we have implemented a special bootloader. And we have other multiple uh, optimizations going on. Um, so this is the optimized sequence that I'll be talking about. And I also like to refer to a talk by Qasim, which says, how do we standardize these early access to hardware? So we still have our PMIC. You still need your power. But as funny as it sounds, it just needs to do it faster. That could mean the difference between your SOC starting from 15 milliseconds to 45 milliseconds to 100 milliseconds, and you've already lost your, some of your KPIs. Right? So the choice of PMIC is the first step. Now, the next thing is, if you remember, I said that ROM initializes the device drivers that are required for the boot media. So why do you want to waste this time by closing it and letting the later stage open it again? So what we've decided to do is we initialize the boot peripherals, and we leave it open so that the next stage can directly use it under, uh, under the assumption that it is already open, which SPL does not let us do at this point. Um, another cool thing that we've done at Text Instruments is that uh, in a typical use case of OSPI NOR, we are able to shift into the AD, AD, AD mode with, and at 1666 megahertz. Typically, we work with a lesser uh, megahertz, which is about 42 to 50 megahertz. But it's something called the OSPI 5 tuning, if you're familiar with the jargon, right? to allow us maximum throughput right from ROM. Um, for the next stages, I will let Samya, the leader of the RTOS stack, take over. Hello, everyone. I guess I'm audible. So yeah, so as Asus uh, uh, told a bunch of problems that we are seeing with respect to SPL, the need time, and all stuff that we have with respect to SPL. In a typical heterogeneous system, right, you, you see like when you boot and your first bootloader comes, say for SPL, you have a very small on-chip RAM because of various reasons you keep a smaller RAM. You don't have DDR access. You have to initialize DDR. So the SPL does it for us today. We do have it. But once you boot that, right, there are a bunch of scenarios like you have so many peripherals or the firewalls or something which are already opened by uh, ROM for you, and you are not able to reuse it at a later stage. And you are not able to use the boot, uh, the boot peripherals at its maximum or what do you say, throughput or maximum of the boot, uh, boot drivers that give you, what do you say, already initialized by the ROM, you're not able to use it at its maximum capability. You again, at the later stage, you again go, go through the same process of initializing again. So if you compare, we, what we have here in TI is a secondary bootloader. And we do boot from a smaller chip, on-chip RAM, just like SPL, but later, it does a DRM initialization, the DRAM initialization to make and up the DDR. But later, it, what it does is instead of initializing all the boot peripherals again, it reutilizes the initialized thing that is already done by ROM. ROM. And it will start copying the first image that is the stage two bootloader from the uh, flash device and put it in the DDR. And why we have staging here? Okay. So you may ask that, why do we require staging? We could have done it in the same thing. It's because normally, if you see today, uh, we can have one concept is like your 
in a production software, right, you always want one type of boot media, one primary boot media and a fallback boot media, which you will always boot from. So you don't require like, okay, I will have a bunch of support of different boot medias in my bootloader. So what you can do is like, uh, yeah, I, I will just have the bootloader for this boot media. So with, with the TI's SBL, you can have a particular bootloader that is only interested towards this boot media, whatever you are interested in, so whatever you want to have. So what it does is like, it still reutilizes the initialized boot peripheral that you have from the ROM and keeps on continuing from stage one to stage two. And apart from that, in all this scenario, in your heterogeneous SOC, you have a requirement of power and clock control. So when all the other hosts are about to be booted, and once they boot, they will start requiring access to different peripherals, and they will start requiring access to clocks, the powers, and all. So you have, anyway, we, we talk about uh, SCP firmware, or what we call in TI is a device manager that overall controls the power management, the clock control, and all. So before all cores boot, you need to have that thing available in your system. So what we did is, with this uh, stage two bootloader that we have, we have that device manager plus bootloading happening at the same time in a multi-threaded context. So you have your clock control, the power control all available at the same time, and also you're booting different cores together with it. Now, next thing is uh, in a normal SPL flow, you will expect that, okay, uh, my, uh, uh, remote cores will be booted just at the U-boot stage or when Linux boots up, it does RProc and starts booting the remote cores. Or you can have some hacks at a higher, earlier stage to boot those, but still uh, in a very time critical system where you want to have use cases like early splash, early chime, where you want MCU to come up earlier and do the hardware access and keep it in the initialized state and can you can give uh, those things available to high-level OS like Linux later. So you need you can boot MCU in this context by stage two bootloader earlier in the system, so that all your all your peripherals access like display or audio for Chime and all are already initialized and in the uh, in the system, and you are able to give a smooth user experience. Next, there are a bunch of optimizations that we did with respect to the kernel. I'll ask Asis to take over. Now the bootloader is done, that's fine and dandy, but now the fun part is the Linux and the file system, right? We always think Linux takes a lot of time. Now, how do we do that? The boring answer is reduce your logs and remove the configurations that you have. But the problem that is, um, what configurations do you want to remove? We don't know that, right? It's, it's a customer dependent thing. Um, so I've highlighted a couple of uh, configurations that we had to remove and directly affected us by a lot. But please understand that some of these have security implications. Some of these are required maybe, I mean, not these guys, but understand the system that you're trying to optimize. For example, RO data works with, uh, has security implications and not just remove things. Right, um, some things like MMC, SPY, debug FS is just a file system for debugging. We don't really need that. But um, you're welcome to uh, go to the link that we have to find out the entire configuration file that we've developed for, the, for an early boot scenario where we've highlighted how, what configuration takes how much time in our system. So now uh, the file system uh, typically is packaged as an init RAM FS with our kernel so that we can save some time and boot in as an init RAM FS. Um, for the purpose of that, we've chosen sysv init as our init manager. Let's not get into the whole system v init or system d conversation here, but it worked well for us, okay? We understand it a little better than system d at this point. So now that your kernel is small, it's light, you hit process ID one and your file system is ready. So in system v init, we have something called run levels, which is RC, RCs uh, 1, 2, 5, and S and Ds, um, out of which RC5 is the one that's responsible during your multi-user uh, login. 
Now, in that, what you do is you go check if this, a service is required or not, supposing UDEV or Ethernet or things like that, and you remove things that you do not need. Okay. Um, another things, uh, another experiment that we tried is what kind of file system do you want? Do you want ext4? Do you want ubifs? Or do you want squashfs? Now, for those who don't know such file systems, I recommend going reading it. Um, I want to highlight that UBIFS in particular is very interesting, where UBI is a software layer uh, that's used for volume management and where leveling. Okay, and uh, UBI is a is something that scales linearly, whereas UBIFS, the file system based off it, scales logarithmically. What it means that the more size you have, it still saturates after a while, but at the end of the day. UBFS also scales linearly since your software stack also scales linearly. Okay, why is this important? Because this is the results that we've achieved uh, from trying out different file systems. The same file system that we have, the way you package it as an ext4, UBIFS, or even squashfs, these are the results you get. Now, ext4 to UBFS is a surprise to us because UBFS is known to have faster mount times. And yet, from the graph that you can, uh, from the table, you can see that it adds 48 milliseconds to ext4. Now, that is very surprising to us, and we've not been able to figure out why. Uh, and the compression is not that much, so it's only 7 MB. It should have been fine. SquashFS, on the other hand, is completely understandable. You are compromising mount times for smaller um, kernel sizes. That SquashFS that you see, 5 MB, is, is, is squashed quite a lot, right? Um, and at the end of the day, this is what results we've achieved. I think. Yeah. So on the left is the optimized uh, uh, sequence, and on the right is still the regular one, which is going and taking its own sweet time. Right. Uh, you can still further improve this a little bit, but I wanted to show some logs that are going on, and you can see how much time this takes. Right. We booted 12 times. I don't know, 15 times by now. Um, these are some of the more profiling that we have done, and it's important to profile these systems. You want to know exactly how much time these take, and these have been done using GPIOs and logic analyzers. Okay, uh, you can see that the regular boot sequence. I've not uh, mentioned it. I guess it's about 25 seconds, whereas our optimization is done within one second, one zero seven zero to be perfect. And you can notice that our MCU application, our chime, or display is already up in within 125 milliseconds. Right. So at the end of the day, all of these optimizations are nice, but how do we get them back into SPL? How do you get them back to U-Boot? What happens is that you, uh, boot time optimization is not a new concept. Everyone's done this. Now, how do we proliferate it back into the community? Right. So. How do we get what we've done back? How do we get the assumption that a previous stage has worked on the device driver so you don't have to waste time resetting it and opening it again? That's a couple of questions that you're asking. And a file system, it's, it's very bare bones at some point. It's, I'll be honest, it's practically unusable except for the things that you really want to do. Um, I guess I didn't mention that, but uh, once you have the tiny file system in there uh, and your graphical application is running, that's when you shift to a full file system after a while to have all your complete extended functionality in, right? So how does this bare bones file system sit with building your Octo recipes? How do we maintain these guys? Um, and finally, if somebody is knowledgeable here, we'd like to understand why, if we're doing the right thing with UBIFS or ext4, and, or we should try something else altogether, right? We also had another look at CRAMFS as another file system there. Uh, but we didn't have any uh, measurements for that. Uh, these are some of the references that we've had. And if anybody's interested in recreating the environment we've had, you can go out of the boards, you can try all the commands. We've got how, how to guides as to where, what, we're time, what time we're spending. Uh, I'm opening it for q and yeah. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you. Um, thanks for the presentation. Yeah. 
uh, it's just an hypothesis about the amount time mm -hmm. with squash FS. Um, as far as I am, oh, thank you. Uh, as far as I know, um, you can really notice the difference in the latency um, in a scenario where you are um, reading your file system, either if it's an init from FS or mm -hmm your actual root file system from the disk and uh, um, considering that you're compressing it you are doing fewer reads from the disk and in that specific scenario you could notice a um, decrease in mount time correct but and in your case mm -hmm. so what was uh, in your case uh, i presume the the init from fs um, the, the the file system was already shipped in the kernel binary correct Right, because that that would make sense to me. Because in that case, you completely discard this idea where um, reading from the disk is lower, so the advantage dis kind of disappears. Correct. But anyway, I was surprised too to see, uh, even though you cut the size like in half or mm -hmm. even more, and still you got uh, a few milliseconds. Oh, yeah. I would be disappointed as well. <laughs> Exactly. It's all about decompression and compression times, right? Mm -hmm. The more you decompress it, the more the decompression time also will be. Have you tried with LZO? Uh, yeah, I, I believe, oh no, we did not try that. I think we had about four things to try. We, we tried two and we decided, oh no, this is too bad. Mm -hmm. yes. Fine, we'll try out LZO. Thanks. Yeah. I guess I'm going to follow up a little bit on SquashFS as well. There are settings around whether you decompress directly to page cache, whether you decompress into a temporary buffer mm -hmm. and then copy it over to page cache, and also whether you're doing it single-threaded, multi-threaded. Did you investigate how you're actually using SquashFS in kernel? No, I did not. Let me just write that down. I, I did not have the, we did not have too, too much time to get into that or the expertise, to be honest with you. So, but I will look into that. All right. Uh, so my question goes on splash screens. So going back to the boot, like sequence. Mm -hmm. so the you have the, one or the regular one? The, yeah, we can start with the regular one. So usually you have one splash screen for the U-boot and another for the kernel. And then between changes from the U-boot to the kernel, you have like a black screen between them. And then when you change to the kernel to the user space, where the application lives, you also have a black stream between them. Yeah. So in your fast sequence, do you get rid of those black screens? Yep. Not. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So, so even you can do get rid of that in case of SPL, there is something called simple frame buffer thing, and you can allocate the same frame buffer space, keep on until the kernel, that it can reutilize it. So it's there in TI platform. We have, uh, I guess it's been upstream, that uh, we don't see that black screen. Mm -hmm. And with respect to the RTOS, uh, so basically the splash is there. The same frame buffer can be occupied by the kernel also. It can just keep on relaying the same frame data. So, uh, so it's all. Uh, so it's the same thing. It's just like in the SPL flow, you have a U boot uh, doing the splash. In case of the SBL, it's the MCU or whoever is the bootloader that can do. Questions? Going once, going twice. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>